Hello, dear ones, and greetings from the Center for Contemporary Mysticism in Philadelphia. My name is Joe Irwin, and it's a joy to gather with you again and explore this amazing journey that we share. Today, we welcome Kathleen Wiley, Jungian analyst, family therapist, and author, as she leads us in a discussion on embodiment from a Jungian perspective. What does it mean to be embodied? And how can we experience the body as a place where spirit and matter are one? Kathleen lives in North Carolina and maintains a private practice where she helps clients to see that God is part of the human experience of living in a physical body and being in relation to all the world around us. So we feel that's a very important message and, and teaching for us. And so, Kathleen, we're very glad to have you with us today. We're honored that uh, you've taken time out of your busy schedule to be with us. So welcome aboard. <laughs> Thank you. And we, we welcome back, as always, uh, our interviewer extraordinary, Patricia Pierce. As you know, Patricia is an author herself and a former pastor and a spiritual teacher and the host of the We Awakening podcast, which is very insightful. You should check out. And if you're new to the center, be sure and visit our website, which is simply contemporarymysticism.org, where you'll find hundreds of resources, videos, groups, that you can participate in, such as spiritual sharing groups or meditation groups and so forth. Remember, our goal is to be a partner with you in your journey. So however you want to be involved, uh, get involved, support, join, be a member, do whatever you feel called to be to help us continue this work. And remember, there's a Q&A session after we have our interview, as you probably know if you've been here before. So after Patricia and Kathleen have a good time to dialogue and interview, we'll bring some people on board and let you have a chance to dialogue one-on-one -on -one with Kathleen. And uh, so if you think of a question, jot it down. If you're like me, you'll forget it if you don't jot it down. So when you have a question, jot it down. And when we come to the Q&A, you can click raise your hand and we'll bring as many as we have on, uh, on screen and let you dialogue with Kathleen or Patricia. And if you're bashful to show your face, you can put a question in the Q&A box, <laughs> and that way we'll get to as many of those as we can. So it's wonderful to have you with us, Kathleen. We've been looking forward to this, and so at this point, I'll turn it over to you and Patricia, and I'll come back in just a little bit for our Q&A. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jill. So, Kathleen, I've, uh, I really enjoyed our previous conversation, and I felt like, oh, <laughs> there's some really beautiful energy that was flowing between us as we began to delve into some of the topics that we're going to be talking about today. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing that we didn't talk about that, that at that point that I'm very curious about is, um, so you have been trained and steeped in the Jungian approach, mm -hmm. um, and my perception of Jungian psychology is not that it's particularly body-based. I, mm -hmm. I have this perception of it as being fairly of the mind, um, working with dreams and symbols, and it isn't really known for being an embodied approach. So I'm curious, as a Jungian analyst, how, how this came to be so central for you, embodiment. That's a great question. I'm glad you're asking that because I always say to the therapist who I'm doing consultation with who are training to be Jungian analyst that if you are doing true analysis, it is not just talk therapy, that there is an energetic exchange. And a couple of thoughts. I have lots I could say about that. But the first I'm going to say is that Jung himself says that the symbols of the cell arise from the depths of the body, the symbols of the self. And by self here, he means what we call the self with a capital S, the totality of psyche, which he says also in his writing is the God within. I think of the self with a capital S as the psychological structure that is the, the reflection of the divine essence, whatever that means to you. There, it isn't tied to any one tradition or one image because we know our images and concepts are not, you know, the, the spoken Tao is not the true Tao, right? The, that <laughs> our image. So the symbols that speak to us, that call us forward, whether it's symbols that come through our dreams, symbols that come through waking numinous experiences, symbols that, that we 
just encounter randomly, but somehow speak to us, resonate with something deep, deep within our cellular consciousness. Jung knew this. He also developed his primary central theory of complexes, which I call feedback loops. A complex is a psychic structure that has an affective core, affect meaning emotion with body sensation that then collects experiences around it. And the experiences that we have very, very early in life around our body-based experiences feelings, because that's what an affect is, it's a physiological activation that has an emotion attached to it, that actually shapes who we are. So Jung himself did not leave the body out. Unfortunately, though, as the teaching has passed down, and as books get written, and as a lot of, happens with a lot of things, the body-based experience can become secondary to the concepts and the intellectual understanding. So I have a passion to, to get back to the roots. And the other thing I will say is my first Jungian analyst, um, who I would like to acknowledge, Leah Burney, who has passed. Leah, in addition to being a Jungian analyst, was a um, certified massage therapist. She was trained in Traeger and Feldenkrais. And she incorporated body-based therapies alongside of the talk aspect of Jungian analysis. So the marriage for me of Jungian analysis was never separate from the body. Mm. Yeah. Well, it's it's really heartening to hear that. And I didn't know that about Jung, that he really did, that he really was, uh, the body was foundational in his um, understanding of these things. So... In you know, in the Western paradigm, body, mind, spirit have all been compartmentalized and separated one from another. In your experience, what are the consequences of that, of that compartmentalization? I think distress, whether it's physical distress or illness, or it's emotional or mental distress and illness. From a Jungian perspective, when we do not live in sync with the energetics of our own nature, um, we become sick in some way. And I think the split has put the body and mind at odds. And so we look at the body now in the Western world as something to be conquered, as something that's supposed mm -hmm. to do our bidding. We've totally forgotten that the first way that the unconscious, and I believe spirit is going to speak to us, is through the body. Yeah, it all comes through the body. And we've forgotten that. So I think there's a disconnection from one's own core cell. There's a tremendous amount of suffering and distress that's created because we aren't in sync with our own nature. And I think that ripples out to then our disconnection from one another and to mother nature and to all of life that um, does have it in soul i mean it that the spirit in souls at all and so that split within ourselves i think has created all kinds of ripple effects into our environment and policies and etc 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 yeah so so that paradigm sort of cultural paradigm leads to sort of a, a personal fragmentation of of the self yeah so in how would you describe what it means to be healthily embodied? <laughs> yeah, um, I'm chuckling because my favorite quote from Jung is he says, by building a conscious relationship to the unconscious, we can mitigate the negative effects of the unconscious. And that's that's the vehicle. It's about being in relationship to what goes on inside of us. And in being in relationship, it requires we cultivate the capacity to listen deeply mm -hmm. and to be open. I mean, I think this is where the mystical tradition um, has so much uh, to offer in terms of pointing people in the direction of knowing their true inner teacher. You know, I'm always saying to people, don't believe anything I say, check it out. I mean, it, the only teacher worth following is the inner teacher, which for me is that point of connection with the divine within the larger self. So 
listening deeply, being willing to relate to what comes up and being curious. You know, we we have so split things apart that we have a toe ache or we have a, a calf ache and think, oh, that's just because I exercised yesterday or I hit my toe. Well, okay, that's part of what happened. But the physical plane reality is only one reality. And that corresponds to an emotional, a mental, and a spiritual spiritual energy. It all, I think of it as um, it's on a continuum. And this, again, if we go back to Jung, he says that the instinct and the archetype, the instinct being biological based impulses and desires and drives are like the infrared end of the light spectrum. And the archetype, the numinous, the disembodied, the idea, the image, the concept is the um, ultraviolet. But they they are on the same continuum. You don't have an instinct without an archetype. You don't have an archetype without an instinct. So I would say there's not a body-based physical experience, including pain, that doesn't have an emotional, mental, and spiritual correlate, and vice versa. Mm. So when we fragment and we cut those things off, we don't even get to truly embody our spiritual experience. They become mm -hmm. head things, so they get lost. And then we need to go back and have another peak experience, another retreat, instead of it changing something in us that then changes our day-to-day -day life. That's what embodiment does. Yeah, I. well, there's so many things I could say right now. Um, so let me just pause and consider <laughs> which one I want to go with. Um, I know for myself, well, I think we all can relate that when the mind is sort of disconnected from the physical mm -hmm. experience it can spin off into its own you know fabrications and we can spiral down into these gloomy places um and i know that one of the like the first foundation of mindfulness practice is about the body it's about mm -hmm. being in the body the body brings us back into the present moment can bring the mind back from its wanderings you know, back to, to the present moment. And, um, and I also, you know, I, I feel like the body can sometimes be way wiser than the, mm -hmm. than the mind. Mm -hmm. Do you find that like the body is, is, is providing information that we tend to discount or override? Absolutely. Um, there's a beautiful book by a science writer by the name of Annie Murphy Paul called The Extended Mind, Thinking Beyond the Brain. Mm -hmm. And in there, she has three sections that pro share research over the last two or three decades of how thinking is not a function of the brain, but that thinking includes the body. And so she has a section on thinking with the body thinking with the environment and thinking with other people. And in the section of thinking with the body, the first section is thinking with sensation. So most mindfulness practices start with a body scan. And this is the first practice that people in my embodiment circle work with. And a body scan is just that. You slow down long enough to direct your attention inward and notice what's happening in your body. She says, Annie Murphy Paul says in her book that um, people who, the, the, the body scan is the best vehicle for helping people get into their body and know what's going on. But she quotes research like that had been done with stockbrokers on Wall Street and that the stockbrokers who will make a trade based on their gut, something they feel in their gut, make more money than those analysts, those traders who have to go do the analysis before they make the trade that there's something about the knowing in the body and that the stock traders who can tell you what their heartbeat is just spontaneously make more money they're tuned in to information coming <laughs> yeah. up through the bodily intelligence now yeah. interestingly enough about thoughts Jung says that our thoughts are just as much occurrences from the body as our affect so the idea that the thinking does that, that we're in charge of all of our thoughts is also false from a Jungian perspective. Now, we all know we can take it over with our ego and our ego can 
and historical self can fabricate all kinds of things. But that initial thought that comes up spontaneous also is arising from something that is within the bodily intelligence. Yeah, and I think of that too, that spontaneous, you know, arising of, um, I mean, that's that's how inspiration comes. Yes. yes. And, and I experience that as, um, like you're saying, an openness to a greater wisdom. And it's not even the particular body, although the body becomes a vehicle for this inspiration, but it's almost like being part of a whole um, yeah. that that transcends the individual self. Absolutely. Yeah, and I mean, I'm thinking about Jung's model of the psyche, which if you can just imagine an oval shape for a minute that has three divisions, that's three divisions. The lowest division is the collective unconscious, which is that place where the water of all life flows. It's that place out of which the out of the waters of life, the instincts and the archetypes arise. They then move up into the middle level, which is the personal unconscious, where those instincts and archetypes we experience as affects, emotion with body innervation, that collect experiences that become our patterns or complexes as the jargon is, but patterns or feedback loops. Those patterns then rise up into this, this top level, which is consciousness, where our ego, the sense of self that we identify with, that we feel we are, lives, and also the persona, the roles that we, we adopt, the faces we show the world exist, and then the level of collective consciousness. So we all arise out of those waters of life where we're all one. And the beautiful thing with embodiment is we realize that whatever arises in us, even the most disgusting of thoughts or the most negative of feeling, alongside of the beautiful feelings of ecstasy and bliss and the inspiring thoughts are all also coming up from the whole of who we are. And the role of consciousness and the ego, which is extremely important, is to learn how to make meaning of it based on the larger truths and spiritual principles that all the ancient wisdom traditions throughout the ages have taught and various images and symbols and words, but it's, it's fundamentally the same. Mm. I'd never thought of it that way that the, that consciousness is about making meaning of mm -hmm. these deeper, these deeper um, patterns, archetypes and so forth. I'm curious when you, so, so the, the collective unconscious, the waters of the collective unconscious, and then that comes up into the personal unconscious where the, as you're saying, the, the complexes reside. And I think that that's probably what a lot of us in our, you know, in our own lived experience, experience those complexes oftentimes as hindrances to the mm -hmm. full expression of ourselves. Yes. So, um, I'm curious how embodiment helps us or being in touch with our embodiment helps us um, become more aware of those complexes and allow them to begin to loosen, soften, dissolve. What, what, what role does embodiment play in that process? Yeah, well, you have to be in a body to individuate. <laughs> Jung says this, he says, only if you have a body, can you individuate? A spirit cannot individuate. Mm. Individuate meaning to fully embody the essence of who we are. And so if you're going to get to know your complexes, you're going to have to be willing to relate to them. And in order to relate to them, you're going to have to have enough sense of self to stay present and not drown in them, run away from them or try to kill them. <laughs> you're gonna you're gonna <laughs> have to have a self that holds right yeah and so embodiment which if if I want to just talk for a minute about the practices that I see as key to embodiment the body scan the ability to just breathe and notice what's happening in your body then um, relaxation that ability to to be able to let go of tension and tightness because where we tense and tighten, we block information flow. 
I mean, this is what the Rolfers know. This is what Reiki and psychoanalysts know. Then we move into rhythmic breathing because that sinks us into connection with the larger spirit, the divine essence. It helps us drop into a natural rhythm that I'm I'm in this moment associating with the tides, you know, that gentle, mm. that's very calming. Because again, if we're in high excitation, it's going to be difficult to listen and relate. <laughs> Think about the, you know, when that happens, when you're trying to have an interaction with another person, you, there has to be a certain level of calm centeredness. So just those first three embodiment practices are key because then you start to be able to keep yourself and say, wow, I really want to hit that person. Oh, wow. I really want to, I want to lay on my horn and give that person, I, you know, instead of acting it out and dissipating it. So when we can tolerate what's going on inside of us and contain it, then we can begin to see what are our complexes really about. Because so very often, most of the time, when we're having a strong emotional reaction, which is what's going to be happening when your a complex is triggered, 90% of what we're feeling and that's gotten stirred up has nothing to do with the present moment. Mm -hmm. It's about the past. Yeah. But if you automatically dissipate it by yelling, screaming, throwing things, acting on whatever that first impulse is, you lose that concentrated expression and message to get to the heart of it. So if you're going to know your complexes or feedback loops, you've got to be able to calm yourself enough to not not get absorbed by them. It's, I always say it's like you've got to keep a big toe out until you can get a foot out, then you get a leg out, <laughs> and, you know, and you slowly get yourself free from it so you can have a conversation. And even if you start the conversation about what in the heck are you doing, that's better than running away from it because you can begin to, um, you can begin to listen to what is it that it has to tell you. Because Jung is very clear that every neurosis has the seed of the cure in it. Every mm -hmm. neurosis has the seed of the cure. So I would say that that the freedom of the complex, what's needed to be free and, and get ourselves to where we're not automatically taken over is within, the, within that affective core. So we have to be in our body enough to experience it while at the same time, there's a part of us that's outside of it, but connected to it in relationship. Yeah. Wow. That is so interesting. Um, so, so tuning in with the body allows us to be present to what's happening and be the, the, the present observer without, without becoming reactive and having it sort of take us over hijack, you know, hijack our behaviors. Yes. Um, and when you said, you know, not to try to run from it or not try to kill it, I thought, <laughs> well, you know, how often do we do that? Try that approach, right? Like, <laughs> let's just, <laughs> um, so to me, there's, there's also this spaciousness of, of tolerance, of compassion, yes. of holding it, of observing it and holding it in compassion. Yes. Um, because I know just from my own experience, well, they say, you know, what you resist persists and what you judge, uh, is, is strengthened. I mean, it's, yes. um, so, so I love that to be able to just like tune into the body and enter into that mindful state to be able to observe what's happening and to be in relationship with it. I'm totally intrigued by what you said about inside the neurosis is the, mm -hmm. is the healing. Can you say more about that or maybe give us an example of how that would play out? Sure. Um, it, it, so Jung's definition of neurosis is the avoidant, the avoidance of, of legitimate suffering. <laughs> so from a Jungian perspective, we were very Buddhist in that, um, you know, change is inevitable and suffering is just part of the human experience. But the difference is that if we suffer consciously, what is happening in this moment, instead of a neurotic symptom that 
is like a smoke screen or the a, a door that blocks off the original experience. If we're caught in a neurosis, we're going to keep going in the same loop over and over and over again. Because as you said earlier, what's behind the screen is going to persist and, and somehow get louder and louder, right? It does. That's what happens. But if we relate to it, then we can get to the core of what it has to say. Um, and this moment, I'm thinking about shame, I think is such a common mm -hmm. core affect. You know, when I was growing up, Norman Vincent Peale was still popular, and I loved Norman Vincent Peale. <laughs> and I still think his work has a lot of, of um, validity. And also, I know that thinking that isn't uh, from the body, from, from the inside out, isn't going to have power that it's it's mm -hmm. thinking from the top down that's just yep. road affirmations isn't going to work but if it's tapping into a, an energy and you're giving words to something that's touched you inside that's going to have power um but I, I was just thinking about the insecurity complex and i think of insecurity and shame as very close together and i've had my own version of that and still mm -hmm. do and probably most everybody who's listening does and if we can think about that, okay, the shame or insecurity is the center. And then there are moments in my life where I've experienced shame and insecurity and had other people's response to me that has reinforced shame and insecurity and told me how it should be there. And then I have all these collective beliefs and ideas heaped on like, yeah, you shouldn't feel that. You shouldn't think that. You shouldn't do that. You should be ashamed of yourself, right? And then we have this archetypal energy of shame because it's, a, it's an innate affect that if I'm going to ever get free from the shame, I have to be able to tolerate titrate and, and titrating that emotion to get down to this level of okay maybe it's not shameful to want to be sexual maybe it's not shameful to want to actually go for my heart's desires maybe it i do have something to offer even though it's very different from what the rest of the world has to offer. But we have to be able to tolerate meaning, keep ourselves in relationship to the shame, to see all of the neurotic thinking that has gathered around. Because what happens in the neurosis is we, we, <laughs> we're suffering a lot and people think they are really experiencing it. But the, the thinking and the behaviors that they're suffering with again, are actually displacements of the true experience to really be able to realize, yeah, it was very shaming when I got dressed down in front of the class or mm -hmm. when, you know, my parents shamed me in front of my siblings for something that didn't happen at this moment. I don't remember that, but you know, if, if we can't get to that feeling state and have compassion for ourselves and realize that's a part of our historical self, but it's not our whole self. Mm -hmm. It's not our, and it's not even, I believe the true self is an experience we had. So without embodiment, which keeps us in the present moment, we're never going to get separation from our history. Mm -hmm. And why do I want to keep living the same life I've already lived? Yeah, <laughs> that something that you said really like um the the idea that to, to investigate the shame or what's behind the shame mm -hmm. and to recognize well and I think there's a lot of cultural overlay too you know the culture says these things are shameful and we so we end up uh sort of rejecting part of ourselves because we've been shamed for it um, I really appreciate the um, the insight of like to really delve down into what actually is behind this mm -hmm. and then to be willing to affirm it for ourselves, yes. even if it's not affirmed, uh, you know, for us by, by others. Yes. Yes. That ability to, to be present to ourselves compassionately. I mean, I think about again, um, the, the golden rule love yeah well the golden rule do unto others but love your neighbor as yourself love the lord your god 
with all your heart and all your soul and love the neighbor as yourself. I mean, again, you can find that in all great religious traditions in various, maybe worded a little bit differently. That's a sacred truth. That's a psychological mm -hmm. truth as far as I'm concerned. And that until I can have compassion for that part of me that feels so ashamed or so scared or that part of me that feels disgust about something or that part of me that just has such ecstatic joy because, you know, we tend to associate um, discomfort with the quote negative affects, but I've worked with enough people and in my own life know how uncomfortable we can be experiencing joy and ecstasy yeah. and curiosity yeah. and <laughs> right. that sense of aliveness. You know? Yeah. Yeah. It's so true. And people dampen, you know, they, they damp it down and yes. tone it down. Yeah. yeah. I mean, again, people will say you're getting too big for your britches. That's a Southern right. statement. Right. <laughs> you know, right. You're, you're getting right. too big. For, or who do you think you are to be doing that? You know, yes. I have more than one analysis over the last 30 plus years who's had that message in, in maybe not those exact words, but in one way or another. Mm -hmm. And so from very early on in life, so often we are shamed out of our experience. And yet, yet it is our experience that makes us who we are. And I believe it is our experience that is the connection to the, the largesse of the divine essence everywhere and in all. Yeah. And what you're describing about people hiding their light, essentially, yes. um, hiding, hiding the fullness of their divine light. Um, we, we are sort of taught to, <laughs> we're taught to do like that, tone we? it down, tone it yeah. down. Yeah. yeah. So we're touching now, you know, on the, on the divine and, and how in your experience and in your work, how then is embodiment like a portal to, to the mist, we'll say, you know, this is the Center for Contemporary Mysticism. Right. <laughs> and, and I think of mysticism as the direct experience mm -hmm. of, of the divine, which, mm -hmm. of course, we are part of. I mean, we're not separate. That's not a thing that's separate from us. So how, um, in your experience, how, what role does embodiment play in our own mystical capacities, our own capacities to experience the divine? Yeah, so... I love Rudolf Steiner's work for any of you who are, are you familiar with Steiner's work and bit, yeah. um, his uh, con concept of the 12 senses and that we have more than just the five physical senses, mm -hmm. but all of the senses come up through the body. They're, they don't come from the outside in. And if you'll just stop for a minute and think about your own numinous experiences, it was still an experience meaning something was happening in your body. Very physical. Is a very physical experience. So the encounter with the divine essence is not an encounter that happens intellectually or conceptually. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's not from here up. Right. In fact, it typically is from here down. Yeah. And then one spends the next <laughs> yeah. year or two up here trying to think, okay, what was exactly. that? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I mean, the it, mind it, is blown by what's happening in the body. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, interestingly enough, for me, as growing up, I had a lot of mystical experiences. And so when I discovered Jungian thought, it was like, oh, that's what, that's what was happening. Oh, that's what that, it gave me a language to understand my personal subjective self in relationship to the objective universal. So yeah. Yeah. some people come to Jung and they feel like they've discovered a whole new world, but that wasn't the case for me. It was very much meaning. I want to throw in here my favorite definition of faith because, um, <laughs> because I think this is embodiment, actually. And my favorite def definition of faith comes from Dion Fortune. And Dion Fortune, were you, are you familiar with her work? Wait, no, I, I was thinking of somebody else. No, I'm okay. not. I don't think I am. Well, so Dion Fortune was a contemporary of Jung, and she was a psychologist in Great Britain who was also an occultist. Now, my little Southern Baptist girl needs me to say for me, <laughs> occult means unknown and, hid and hidden and unconscious. <laughs> it does not mean satanic. Occult meaning hidden <laughs> and unconscious, okay? So anyway, in her book, The Mystical Kabbalah, she says that faith 
is the result of a supra conscious experience, which cannot yet be translated into terms of brain consciousness, but which uh-huh. nonetheless changes the person forever. Wow. Embodiment changes you forever because the energies that you are encountering integrate. They integrate into your cellular being and thus you, you're different. I'm thinking of an analysis I worked with years ago who had difficulty speaking up with her um, then estranged husband. And she was really struggling to get her voice. And one day she came in my office and she sat down and she said, I did it. I did it. It's just like suddenly, all of a sudden, these words were coming out of my mouth. I didn't even have to think about it. I didn't even have to invoke courage. It just happened. That's embodiment. Mm. And Jung very much believed that that level of transformation can happen. And I, I know that to be true. We don't have to always be trying to pull up over everything. She had an experience that changed her forever. It wasn't faith in a dogmatic or theological or academic sense, but it was an embodied experience that changed her. Mm. Yeah. yeah, it's uh, um, it's like a knowing. It's like it's like yes. it's like a knowing in in one's being. Yes, that yeah, it's not it's not dependent on reason or right. or the thinking mind at all. It's just like a, a knowing. Um, it, I'm just gonna riff a little bit here. Um, yeah. But the heart, for instance, you know, I experienced the heart as a center of wisdom Mm -hmm. and guidance in a very palpable way. I mean, Mm -hmm. very palpable. It's like this radiance, you know, that Mm -hmm. happens in my chest. And it's almost like, you know, when you're kids and you're like pin the tail on the donkey and, you know, people are saying, "You're, you're cold, you're getting cold, you're getting warm, warm, warm. It's like the heart tells me that I'm getting warm, 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 you know, when I'm like, yeah. when something arises like an idea or an inspiration so i've really come to trust that you know those physical sensations as mm-hmm. way more reliable than mm-hmm. what the mind can can conjure um because it can make up a lot of things that aren't necessarily always helpful um right and so and they talk about how i mean there's there's research now on uh, heart math has been doing mm-hmm. research on that the you know the the mind and the heart are talking to each other all the time and the heart actually talks more than the mind does like the heart is sending more information than the brain yes. than the brain um and so so really tapping into our own embodied existence as a way to really enter into our own healing process and being mm-hmm. able to be mindfully present, compassionately and mindfully present to whatever is arising within us, to stay present in the moment. And and do you find that just that practice alone starts to soften those complexes? So it's just the present mindfulness, the awareness that, that that itself is sufficient to begin to untangle those patterns. Absolutely, because to untangle the pattern, you first have to be able to be in relationship to it. You know, I want to speak to what you were saying about the heart, because I think this is important. And part of what I have been doing as we've been having this conversation is I have been feeling the energy flowing up from my feet through my abdominal cavity, up into my heart, through my head, and circling the energy. And this is a a concept that comes from alchemy, which is seen as um, being imagery for the process of individuation. And a third of Jung's writings are on alchemy, actually. The idea of circling the energy. So Jung himself wrote that there are really three centers of consciousness, the head, the heart, and the gut. So for me, part of what happens in the embodiment process is those three levels come into 
um, harmonious synchrony. Instead of being at odds with one another, they begin to align. And we, through relating to whatever's dissonant in our nature, whatever is um, out of sync, actually is what does soften and begin to help things find a harmonious balance. So that when we get it, that again, head, heart, and gut are designed to work together. They make they make a whole that's um, greater than the sum of the parts. Is that right? That the, the mathematical print, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Mm -hmm. And so that that when we begin to embody and pay attention to all of that, we do start to get underneath the learned patterns, the feedback loops that block our seeing how it is all connected. Yeah. And then what happens is you were sharing, and again, as I, and I'm sure many, most probably everyone listening has at some time had an experience where you just knew something. You couldn't really explain how you knew it. You know, you, you might say, I just know it in my gut, because that's, again, a phrase we use, but you don't really know where it comes from. You just know it's there. You know, it just is, it's, it's just there. It's the whole of it. Yeah. 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 This is perhaps a little tangential, but I had a dream last night. I mean, I'm not going to tell the dream, but yeah. just one. Okay. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> the Jungian analyst could really go into that, right? But it, but it included um, an image of the Northern Lights, mm -hmm. and as in my journaling, I was I was considering that that the Northern Lights are are visible. It's 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 the you know the solar energy. Um, there's like an, an interplay with earth's atmosphere and mm -hmm. it's like the so that the, the tangible is required to make the light visible and i and i think of that as our embodied experience like we are here making that divine light visible in our own ways um those these spectacular photos that we've been seeing of the northern lights you know the colors and the contours and i think of each of us as on the planet in our own, as being the Northern Lights, you know, giving, giving, uh, making the divine light um, manifest uh, on this plane. So in terms of um, practices, you mentioned some of them, but maybe you can go over those again. The, you mentioned, you know, rhythmic breathing, you mentioned body scan, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but when you're working with someone and you're, re you're really helping them get in touch with the body as a source of wisdom, as a, as a, a place where healing can happen, um, what are the practices that you really encourage people to do? Yeah. So one other thought I have to put out there, Jung says that if we really knew the body and mind or, or matter and spirit are same aspects, are, are different densities of the same transcendental being, okay? Mm -hmm. So your imagery of the Northern Lights is really beautiful. We are all light beings, if we, but we just happen to be cloaked in our body, which we need in this and, mm -hmm. and is important. Um, so... You know, my work has different um, <laughs> different windows. I guess I'll say it that way right now. And so if I'm sitting with someone um, who's come to me for analysis, I'm going to respond to them, hopefully in a human way that automatically will allow them to relax and deepen into their experience. Um, if someone is working with me in my online embodiment circle, I'm actually teaching six embodiment practices where um, you work with the one practice for a month at a time. And then there are opportunities to come together and ask questions and share experiences. And those six experiences, I want to give credit, come from a little book by Israel Regardi, who was a chiropractor and another occultist, <laughs> um, who... Um, they call the one year manual. And those first six practices that we work with are the, our body awareness, which is the body scan, um, relaxation, rhythmic breathing, then mind awareness. And the mind awareness practice, you actually take a tape recorder or no one has tape recorders anymore. You take your phone and pull up voice memos and you speak, you just talk for 10 minutes. 
It's kind of like doing stream of consciousness writing in your journal, but the value of saying it out loud is your ears hear it. And if I'm having a conversation with you, I'm not going to be able to write what's happening in my chatterbox. But if I develop the capacity to hear it, then even as we're talking, my inner ear will be hearing what I'm saying, mm -hmm. which means I can receive the messages that are coming up from the deeper self. So the mind awareness practice is speaking it out loud. You don't go back and listen to it. It's about, again, cultivating the muscle. I often say the embodiment practices are like going to the gym. You're developing the muscles. So when you need them, they're there. You know, I go to the gym and lift weights, not because I want to lift weights, but I want to lift the 20 pound, 20 pound bag of mulch or whatever. The fifth practice is concentration and use of a mantra, because with focus, we can set intention where then we can fish in the collective unconscious. <laughs> and we we want to have um, focus because everything's in the collective unconscious. So to just sit and open to say, okay, let me, whatever wants to come, come, I think is a little dangerous. <laughs> but, <laughs> but if I put in the fish hook of, um, I'm a, I want to receive what's the next step for me on this journey or what's for my highest good or, you know, or something about a specific question, that's, much safer. And then, and of course, a mantra is a beautiful way to quiet the mind, to settle into rhythmic breathing, and to help us begin to tap into the objective universal consciousness, the transcendent. It gets us out of the personal subjective consciousness into the transcendent, but with the focus, the fish hook of the mantra. So again, we don't want to dissolve in it and disappear. That's psychosis, okay? We want to be in relationship to it. And then the sixth practice is developing the will. And will we could spend hours talking about. So I'm going to just offer that the working definition for will, as I'm talking about it, is accessible psychic energy that can be channeled in a specific direction. Ooh, I love that. Mm. Accessible psychic energy that can be channeled in a certain direction. Mm. So it's not about thinking that we can um, impose our will or manifest whatever we want, mm. but it's about beginning to be with the energies that are in us and through relating to them, connect in a way that they're consciously accessible when we want to focus on the book project, or we want to let go of all distractions and be with the beautiful sunset, or we want to be present with someone else without thinking of the to-do list. Yeah, I could, uh, I could really delve into that whole topic of will with you, but we don't have time to do that. No. <laughs> uh, one of the things that occurs to me is, so the Center for Contemporary Mysticism, way back before COVID, would meet in person. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, with COVID, we went online, which gives us the opportunity to interview somebody who's, you know, not local, which is, you know, that's opened up a whole new thing. And also to, you know, we have now people who participate as, as attendees from all over. Mm -hmm. So there's been a benefit and it seems as though, and I'm curious about, you know, from an embodiment perspective, it seems as though our relationships are becoming less embodied <laughs> because of the online experience. And I'm just curious if you have any thoughts about that. And I appreciate what you said a little while ago about, you know, even though we are talking online, you are in this very moment doing your embodiment practice. So you are fully embodied and yet you and I are not present as bodies with one another. So there's that dimension that's that's absent. I think I think we all can recognize now that there's a different energy when we're together in body. So what do you think is important for us as we sort of move into this new, you know, frontier of being connected globally um, as embodied beings? How do we navigate that? Yeah, the first thing is you have to be embodied where you are, because I have had experiences of working with people via Zoom and online 
that have felt more real and embodied to me sometimes than with people in a room physically who are really somewhere else, even though their body's there. Or maybe shut down or, or something. Or shut down. Yeah. <clears throat> so I think the, the first thing is to be embodied, be in your body and really be. I mean, <laughs> be, it sounds so simple, but to be present to what's happening in you. The second thing I find is that working online and via Zoom requires tapping in to the energetics of the person I'm with without having the cues of the magnetic field of the physical form. Mm -hmm. So if we were mm -hmm. in the same room, our body would be giving off heat. We would be seeing subtle flushes of the skin. We would be, uh, you know, there would be a different movement of our head and our eyes. One of the things I've found so artificial about Zoom is we're always looking like this. Whereas <laughs> if we were in the same room together, we might be looking out the window and sharing a moment about the birds or um, and so I've, when I realized that I started saying to my analysis, you know, if I'm looking around, I'm still paying attention, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> you know, because it, it's so unnatural, right? Yeah. You know, yeah. um, it, it's like, and, and so I think we, <laughs> I think being aware that there's a different energetic experience going on, but unless I am fully embodied, I'm not going to be able to go to what um, in the esoteric tradition, they talk about as the etheric field and the psychoanalytic world, we call it the subtle field or the, the analytic field or the third body. There is a subtle field and the alchemists talk about this. That's an energetic field that transcends all form. So if I'm fully in my body and I'm tethered and rooted in the earth fire that can then reach up into the heavens, but keep me here, I can pick up what's happening and the ether, the magnetic ethers and bring it in, mm -hmm. you know, now from a Jungian perspective, I would just say pulling it up from the collective unconscious. We can I mean either direction, whatever works for works, you know, but without the receiving station of the body, we're not going to get it, whether we're physically in the room or we're by teleconference mm -hmm. because the body's the receiving station. Yeah, I really appreciate that because I've also had the the experience of being online and there's there is a very palpable energetic connection and it's not lo it's not dependent on location. Right. It's okay. you know trans translocational <laughs> whatever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean it yeah. is happening in that that flow, that field where everything's interconnected whatever have, mm -hmm. whatever term we want to put on it. Right. That, that experience of, of that ultimate union or oneness. Mm -hmm. Well, Kathleen, I know that I could go on and on, but we, we <laughs> do have some time constraints. So thank you so much. I've, mm -hmm. I've really enjoyed this conversation and I'm going to ask Joe to come back on now to, to facilitate our Q and a, I'm going to turn my video off. I'll still be here, but, um, but I'll, uh, I'll just poof and disappear. Okay. Don't go far, even though we're all in the same ecosphere. Uh, <laughs> Kathleen, uh, thank you so much, you and Patricia, for that enlightening conversation. It mm -hmm. just opens up so many doors. And as she said, we could kind of go on for forever. But we, we like to give folks a chance, if there's any questions, to raise your hand. And uh, we'll bring you on screen so you can uh, have a chance to talk with uh, Kathleen. So it looks like uh, we have Cliff who has a hand raised. So I'm going to ask him to click on the button that says promote to panelist. And uh, he'll come on screen and unmute himself and you can ask your question. There I am. Hey, Cliff. <laughs> Thank you, Kathleen. That's such a, uh, a rich presentation. There's so much that I... Uh, uh, could uh, ask or talk about, but the one thing that uh, jumped out at me, you talked about, and I, forgive me if I'm not using the right words, but um, killing the unpleasant affect. Mm -hmm. And what that resonated with, we live in such a violent time. Mm -hmm. um, is there a relationship between uh, 
Um, the, the the use of the word killing just kind of resonated with what's happening in the world today to me. Is there, is there, a, is there a connection at all? Yes. And Cliff, good to meet you. And thank you for your question. Absolutely. What we, how we treat ourselves is ultimately how we treat other people, you know? So if I can't tolerate something in myself, I'm, I'm probably going to project that negative thing out on you. And then I'm going to want to get rid of you. Mm. And, you know, and the words of um, Walt Kelly and, and Pogo, for those yeah. of you who remember Pogo from years ago, and he's walking through the swamp and seeing all of the pollution with, um, I, I forget who he was walking with. I'll have to ask my husband. He's the pogo expert in the house. And he says, we still seen the enemy and it is us. Mm. And, and so if we are not able to be present to ourselves compassionately, we'll never be able to create a world that is a world beyond war and a world beyond killing yeah. and yeah. a world beyond lots of other intolerances that because it's it's there's killing in many many ways not just literal physical killing but yeah. killing psychologically killing of people's spirits and so yeah thank you very much yeah thank you cliff for that question uh yeah i think that arises in a lot of us uh kathleen in in this time where um you know, things that have been underpinning for us, such as, you know, if people who are our leaders uh, stand up and say something, whether you agree or not, at least, you know, they're kind of speaking from a sense of truth. <laughs> that's, that's just not the case anymore. I mean, people just stand up and who are leaders, you know, or want to be leaders of the country and, and clearly, um, uh, say things that they know are not true and everybody else knows are not true, but out of a selfish interest to promote their own power and position, they'll stand up and say it. So there are underpinnings like that. And uh, I was thinking just recently, the Philadelphia Orchestra was going to do something about a concert, you know, for patriots and all that. And I realized even the word patriots now has lost its meaning to me in a lot of way, because um, there are people called patriots who are the opposite of what I would have all my 80 years been thought of as patriots, you see. So these are underpinnings that are kind of just yank, yanked out from under us, and we can no longer at times, uh, you know, go to bed at night and, and assume <laughs> we're going to wake up tomorrow and we still have a democracy. And so... I guess my question would be, um, how do you how do you reflect on that with these things that have so radically changed our underpinning and the things that you know that we have always grown up thinking of as part of ourself and you know depended on for our own persona? What are your thoughts? <laughs> yeah, lots of thoughts. Let's That's see. It's a big question. Anna. It's a big question. Yeah. Um, I mean, the first thing I want to say is I, I believe that change begins one person at a time. Mm -hmm. So the, um, the solidity of any structure, institution, organization, country is really tied to whether or not the individual is integrous and are we living in integrity to our own nature and the truths of the universe, because there are truths far greater than personal subjective truths. Mm -hmm. So for me, uh, when I think about being an activist in, in a way of getting out there protesting, it's very overwhelming to me. But when I remember, as Jung said, that the work that I do in my office is laying, uh, you know, that one individual is like a grain of sand. It, it all comes together and changes. So I think we have to deal with ourselves. And in dealing with ourselves, to your question about persona, we have to be willing to let go of persona. We have to be willing to, to rethink what words mean. We have to be willing to struggle to find language that um, speaks to the present moment. And I also think we have to be willing to reclaim language, to mm -hmm. say, this is what this word means to me. Right. And this is right. how I'm engaging with this. Mm -hmm. And I think what we also have to remember is just because someone has a different point of view or someone um, engages in behavior that would not be integrous for us, 
that we're called to not judge yeah. period so. judge and being not judge is what jesus the master said and i think that we have to remember that there's always far more we don't know than we do know mm -hmm. but for me if i can walk with integrity to my own nature and aspire to compassion and loving kindness if i if i can really practice that golden rule mm -hmm. and and live that i mean if you know for the last 2000 years we've been in a christian era but we are so, so far that mm -hmm. the truths that are the heart of again for me all the world's great religions and of christianity we've yet to actualize yeah we've yet to really understand what it means right. to love ourselves and to love our neighbor much less to love the divine and it's all become very, I think, narcissistic, to use a very popular word. It's mm -hmm. become very much about me, 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 and what it is I think. And we've got to get out of that. There yeah. are truths so much greater. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, you've alluded several times to the things that are in all great traditions and all great religions. You know, there's just a truth of the universe. And um, I think sometimes by... Uh, you know, living in a particular country that you feel, you know, has uh, lifted some of those up. And then all of a sudden, right. like I said, the rugs pulled out from under you. Really, you're just saying we have to be more responsible ourselves for what is our own integrity. You know, whether there's a country there agrees with it, whether right. we're living in a country that has a true, right. you know. Um, yeah, and, I, I, and I'm thinking about, I, I was uh, supervising a case presentation at the training mm -hmm. seminar on faculty on for Jungian analysts. And um, one of the, the therapist who was presenting a case was presenting the case of a refugee mm -hmm. um, and who had come through one of the Middle Eastern countries mm -hmm. and been um, just really tortured and raped by, by soldiers. And so, of course, the the group got very, very energized about that. But in our midst was a therapist who is now a Jungian analyst who happened to be a vet veteran himself. He had been mm -hmm. in one of the wars. Um, he, he was, you know, the Vietnam or Korean War. And he said, but you have to remember that 18-year-old young man had no idea what he was doing. Mm -hmm. And he was out there having been fueled yeah. by oh. all mm -hmm. the propaganda. Yeah. And it was just a... It was a sobering moment to remember mm -hmm. <laughs> that even those who commit atrocities mm -hmm. are human beings who often don't have a self. Yeah, yeah. yeah. To, to make a choice and they get caught up in what is the equivalent of, of a mob psychosis. Yeah, yeah. You know, and I think countries can get caught in a mass psychosis and of course, Jung writes about this. He wrote about this um, at the end of the World Wars. And so if this is not new. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, you're exactly right. And and they're more, you know, you have movies like The Walking Dead and so forth. And there are many cases where young people have been so brainwashed in, in cultures that and they don't have how they weren't reared to have a self. And so this this ideology just floods in. And, um, you know, it, it doesn't uh, turn out good sometimes. But I, um, I appreciate your responding to that. And I like the, what I come away with is, is whatever situation or country we live in, we have to be able to claim our own, uh, you know, integrity and in what we believe and what is right and what is good for all and how we're a part of this whole universal mindset. Let me, I don't want to take up too much time. I see that Lisa has a question. Uh, Lisa, I'm going to invite you to come on. You'll see a button that says uh, accept uh, as a panelist. And if you'll click that button, uh, there you go. And unmute yourself and come on and ask your question. <clears throat> there you go. Hello. Welcome. Hey, Kathleen. Um, can you guys hear me? 
Yes, very good. Yes, okay. So, um, um, just to go back to when you were rent, refer, referencing from the book, The Extended Mind, um, and, and it just, and I'm thinking about the embodying practices, but just when you, just the, in the example you gave, and I think it's in the book about there was maybe a stock, a day trader um, who was, had a felt sense. Um, he went within what was when he was they were working that day. And and I'm only using this as an example to further the com the, the question is when he knew um, in his gut, maybe what the decision he wanted to make, maybe about something. And he was that he went on and he was more successful work in in what he was doing versus the ones who had studied and. You know what I'm saying? Maybe analyze which ones to buy, what not to buy it, it, in that fashion. Um, do you think it's, and that's always um, caught, just caught me because I can tell within me, it, if I just can listen to, hey, my gut feeling. Mm -hmm. So can you just elaborate on that, on that, from that book? Not so much on the stock trader case or day trader, just on how if we can listen to our, self and mm -hmm. when we know that's not that's not for you thank you thank you yeah so uh -huh. you know deep listening and listening internally is a muscle we have to develop and it's also a psychic space we have to protect <laughs> I get so aggravated now when I go to the gas pump and there's a tv on the gas pump I mean I haven't we have a TV that's 20 years old and it hasn't been on in probably 20 years. I mean, it's not that if you watch TV, that's fine. But the point I'm trying to make is our culture bombards us with external stimulation and noise everywhere we go. So if I'm going to listen to my deep insights for guidance, then I'm going to have to have a strong muscle and I'm going to have to de have developed that capacity to concentrate and focus my attention internally and not get distracted by the 10 TVs at the restaurant when I'm trying to focus on the conversation with my husband. And so how we do it is we just have to keep going to the gym of the embodiment practices and cultivating those muscles. And as we do that, I also think we have to begin to be aware of the environments that pull us out of our center. I mean, I don't think we spend enough time really thinking about this. We have this idea that we should should all be able to be in every environment and do everything. And you know, my um, one of my ideas of hell would be going to a rock concert with 10,000 other people <laughs> or, uh, or an NFL football game. That would be my idea of hell. That amount of people, that amount of noise, that amount of magnetic energy coming off of mm -hmm. bodies at me. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to put myself in that environment because mm -hmm. it. I have to disconnect from my inner self to be in it. Mm -hmm. If that's your thing, great. Again, I'm not, I'm not holding myself out as the standard by any means. I'm just offering an example of, I think that that stock trader has developed a muscle where they stay connected to that deep, deep core internally in spite of all the distraction around. That's, that's, that's such a good analogy, develop the muscle. And uh, I don't know if Jung was the first one to say it or talk about it, but it's, I've seen it before and it's very important. Let me get to one other question that came in through our Q and A from Sherry. She said, uh, can you speak about the ego as something good as opposed to always being something bad? Uh, Sherry, thanks. That's a great question. So from a Jungian perspective, the ego is the psychic structure that mediates between conscious and unconscious. We need an ego because it has a mediating function. If I don't have an ego, I'm going to be a chameleon and I'm going to be absorbed by whatever I'm, wherever I am. So in order to have a self that holds, there has to be a self that holds. And we experience that vis-a-vis -vis the ego. I think ego gets a bad rap because, again, 
that term gets used in different ways. People will talk about having a big ego. To have an ego in the sense that I'm talking about it doesn't mean big ego. In fact, the more conscious we become, I believe, the more the ego realizes it's, as Jung said, but a speck of light surrounded on all sides by darkness, that the ego is the minutia, it's not the largesse. But without the ego, the largesse cannot come into consciousness. So the ego is very, very much needed as the mediating function. Thank you, Sherry, for that question and for the answer, Kathleen. You know, what comes to mind as you talk about that is it seems to me that we need a healthy ego in a universal sense. And I say that because earlier I'd used the, the concept of democracy. Mm -hmm. Well, if you had ultimate democracy, 50% of the people could vote to kill and eat the other 49%, you see, or 51%. You see what I'm getting at? Yeah. yeah. Any concept that has, a, has goodness available to it has to be mediated and used, you know, with uh, compassion or with common sense. Mm -hmm. and, and that's always... Um, always stood out to me because just, um, you know, democracy in and of itself just means if 51% vote to do something. And we're seeing that today, you know, in the leadership of our country, you know, with the the Senate and the House and all, you know, they're now so closely divided, you know, one way, one vote, one way, one vote, another way. And the point is, there's no overriding ego of sort of even if you don't want to use compassion, just common sense of what's good for the overall. So <laughs> to me, the way you're describing it fits perfectly. It's kind of where we are as a country. Uh, and I don't you know, want to bring politics into it, but it's the point when you get to the point, you're so closely divided like that. And there's no kind of overriding common sense. You know, uh, a lot, a lot of things that are undesirable can happen. So in, in response to Sherry, you know, I, I like that question because it helps me realize how important a healthy ego is. And, and you know, it's, it's, it's not um, always being seen as bad just because people give it a, a dirty rap, you know. So uh, I think uh, we've had some good questions. And uh, did you want to respond any more to that? Uh, you know, I just want to say one thing, and, and that is that um, Edinger puts forth, who was a Jungian analyst, who is a mm -hmm. contemporary of Jung, puts forth the idea of what he called the ego self-axis. Jung himself did not use that term, but I find it very helpful mm -hmm. because the ego that's the healthy ego is the ego in conscious relationship to the totality of the self. Mm. And when we function with our ego, looking within to the larger self, then I believe we do have a healthy ego. Mm. And I also just want to offer, I do believe that there is a unifying principle that is innate within our nature, that is innate within psyche. And I believe that at some point in the history of this country, there was a unifying principle that was informing the founders. Mm -hmm. mm. And I think that what we have to keep our eye on is that the unified whole is what we're really after. The mm -hmm. divisiveness, whether it's in the outer or in the inner, will never, ever mm -hmm. be healthy. That that we have to find a way um, to live together. I would say this in the highest good for all involved. Mm -hmm. And if I can look at whatever comes up inside of me, including anger, contempt, mm -hmm, or mm -hmm. joy and bliss, as how does this fit with the highest good for all parts of me, mm -hmm. then I'm moving, I believe, in the right direction for me personally, but also to contribute to the collective in a way that will be meaningful. And as I'm in leadership positions, when I can keep my eye on the unified whole and that we all, I was leading a group one time and someone got into speaking against one of the political parties mm -hmm. and other people chimed in. And then, then someone said, oh, isn't it interesting how all of us here are blah, blah, you know, pro proponents here? And I said, well, you know, not everybody's spoken. Mm 
We yeah. don't know that. Mm -hmm. And that what we have to remember is that there are points of view that we aren't getting through the media filters. A couple of weeks later, I got an email from someone in that group that happened to be with the other party. And she said, I have never felt so alone as I did during that discussion. Mm. And she said, but you kept holding the space for mm. me to be present. So we think we know <laughs> and we don't know. So we have to, I think, again, aspire in our leadership positions for a unified whole. Yeah. Well, the unified whole is your is your pointing out when looked at on a, a, a larger universal scale, it can protect its own survival. Mm -hmm. You see, like if 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 you let one one part of of something in your body get so out of control, it, it could actually destroy your body. Well, yeah. the same is true even if you have a, a country or right. um, something that's good, if there's not this uh, thing in the middle, some kind of conscious ego that balances it out and listens to all sides, it can, in fact, destroy itself ultimately. Right. And I, I forgot who said, but there, you know, some some famous person was asked about democracy, maybe what's the greatest thing uh, about a country, and he, and he said, it's a democracy if you can keep it. Mm -hmm. And I thought, whoa, <laughs> that, that's get, getting pretty close to home. Well, listen, this has just been wonderful and so enlightening. You know, I want to keep going here. But uh, you've uh, sparked some questions, I think, for all of us, Kathleen. And so I, we want to thank you very much. We're going to ask Patricia to come back on now and join us. But while she's doing that, uh, tell us, you know, what's next for you? Our, our, uh, we always like to ask our guests. You talked a little about some things you're doing for uh, Jim Hollis and different things with the uh, the. Um, Washington group, but what, what, what's up for you? <laughs> well, what's up for me first is I have this book project that gave um, birth to my online embodiment circle that I've got to get finished somehow, okay. somewhere. That's up. Um, yeah. I'm going to be presenting to the Atlanta Young Society in September oh, and um, to uh, the Washington DC Young Society in November. Great. And my embodiment circle is open for new members to join to begin on June 21st. The circle opens twice a year for members. Oh. If any of you are interested. You is can, that at your website? That's at my website. Okay. If you and go, our website is Kathleen uh, Wiley Union. You can go to Kathleen Wiley Jungian Analyst.com. You can also go to innerdivinespirit.com. Okay. I have too many websites. I'm working on consolidating that now. Um, and if and if you don't, if you can't, if you Google me, you'll find me, I think, <laughs> safely say. Um, and so that opens twice a year for members. And um, and it's summertime. I live on Lake Norman. And so I'm ready for swimming in the oh, lake. Great. You know? <laughs> that is wonderful. Yeah. Well, good, good luck with all your things coming up in your book. And, and the program that you have that opens once or twice a year, you say. Right. In fact, I think some of the folks who've participated in that yeah. were here today. And yes. so that's that's very exciting. I also want to say thank you, Patricia, for your part in, in a very stimulating interview. And you can learn more about Patricia uh, and her We Awakening podcast that's uh, very insightful and is uh, you know on the cutting edge of a lot of things we're thinking about and talking about. So you can check that out at her website, which is simply patriciapierce.com spell p-e-a-r-c-e -E, patricia pierce and lastly uh you can learn more about our own center and upcoming programs by going to our website contemporarymysticism.org we have we take we're we're kind of like uh you kathleen we, we take the summer off and rest from our hard work throughout the year but coming back in September, in fact, we have as our guest one of the uh, world's renowned uh, psychics or, or spiritual people, Lorna Byrne. Uh, she's a mystic from Ireland and is a person who grew up, if you're not familiar with Lorna, from childhood uh, with the ability to see and talk with angels around us just as you and I see and talk with each other. And she is a beautiful humble, amazing soul who, in fact, was kind of 
helpful in starting our center because uh, she came to Philadelphia to speak and we got to meet her and work with her and that got uh, some of the things rolling in our head that helped us uh, move toward beginning a center that would invite people to come and tell their story. So she's going to be back with us in September. So watch our website, contemporarymysticism.org for more on that. And um, so thank you. Thank you to everybody here who joined us. Uh, if you didn't uh, get a chance to uh, watch the whole thing, or if you know of people who would like to, uh, it will see within a few days be on our website. Just go to the video section of uh, contemporarymysticism.org. <laughs> so we're glad to have you here. Thank you again, Kathleen. <laughs> Excuse me, I've got the Patricia's call. And so <laughs> we, um, we want you to remember that you're perfect exactly as you are, and we'll see you soon. Bye-bye.